All right, I think we're good. Door is kind of closed, so I will start, and people might be dropping in. Um, yeah, so hello, everybody. I'm Arne. I'm the founder of Green Coding Berlin, and I will be presenting today an open source tool which, which you can measure arbitrary software. So I don't know if in which talks you have been today so far, but I, for instance, have seen a talk where there was a lot about software bloat and how software is not efficiently designed because we live in a scaling economy and stuff like this. So I will be talking mostly today about just measuring and about transparency of software in particular. So first of all, the slide what? So what is the green metrics tool? As the title of the talk already given, it is an open source software tool that is able to measure the energy and in particular also the CO2 consumption of the software that you either as developers have or it can also consume, consume a software that somebody else has written. Uh, it measures typical parameters that you know as developers, which is like network I.O., but it can also measure uh, stuff like CPU energy, it can also measure DRAM energy, it can measure hard disk energy in particular, and AC, DC power, some of you who work with, um, yeah, in, in German, I don't, many people have maybe German don't see these terms, Gleichstrom, Wechselstrom, so it really depends on where you take the signal uh, of the electricity that you want to measure. Um, it measures these according, because you, some of you are probably developers, so you know that measuring software is tricky, so it measures this with the concept of a standard usage scenario. So this is very important through the course of the talk, so this is why I explain it here a bit. Um, if you think of a typical software, let's say a user land software that everybody uses like Telegram or WhatsApp, right, and you want to compare these two, they obviously have different functionalities. So it's, it's a bit, you very easily get in a situation where you're comparing apples to oranges, right? And the thing with the standard usage scenario in particular is that is you, you define um, a use case or a workload that holds true for 80% 80, 80 of the users. So let's make an example with a Word application. So you say, what do you typically do with a Word application? You open it, you write a one-page document, you maybe print it, you make some fonts fat, you maybe introduce a nice word art or Clippy, the nice mascot of Windows 95. So something like that, which holds true for 90% of the users. And this allows you to compare softwares given a use case against each other, because it's obviously tricky to compare Notepad to Word, right? Because they have very different feature sets so that the one application uses more. It's kind of typical. So this is why we have used the concept of a standard usage scenario, which actually originates from the work around the Blue Angel for software, if, you're, uh, if you know that. The tool has a visualization on board because you want to see aggregate metrics, you want to see changes over time, and has an API on board, which I will talk about later because we picture it as an open API later on that everybody can query data from. Um, the question also arises, why? why? Why did we build the green metrics tool? So here about the technical parts. So measuring software and energy consumption was possible before the green metrics tool. There are other tools which can do so. Scafandra can do so. Tools from the Intel, uh, Intel uh, Power Gadget can do so. AMD has a tool. They, they are all kind of very isolated, very targeted to the infrastructure, and not very targeted to software developers in particular. So our goal is to make it as easy as running a CI CD pipeline. So you just fire it off. You can reuse infrastructure files that you already have. So I come from a web perspective. So I think about mm, development processes very often. I think about Google Lighthouse, which makes it easy to see if your website is performing well. Uh, we want to have the process um, not exactly like this, but we want to have it as easy as that. Measuring software is complex. So um, best practices for measuring are typically tough. So Many people are probably here engineering students are at the TU Berlin or have studied engineering before. So you know that measuring can be very tricky because you have to cater for very strong and fixed boundary conditions. Because if you just put a program on this machine, I absolutely cannot compare it to anything else on any other machine before I know the boundary conditions where I'm in. So we create our tool to set them for you basically based on research or empirical best practices. Why did we build a green metrics tool part two? Um, Comparing software is complex. So this is what I sh shared before, basically, when talking about Telegram and WhatsApp. So software must be classified and attributed automatically because I can make these use cases with very specific softwares, but when I will, I mean, given the plurality of software, that there are millions of different softwares out there, everybody has to classify it manually, so this is obviously not working. So the framework has to do it for you, so it has to identify what the software generally does to put it in the same baskets with different software to make it at least comparable given certain boundary conditions. 
uh, we're measuring the transparency on the energy consumption, uh, sorry, we're missing transparency on the energy consumption of software. So the dream with our tool is that because it's open source and will, when people will use it and measure their software, you will have an idea of what a typical application consumes. So probably nobody of you knows by firing up Word, how much Word actually consumes in terms of energy and what kind of CO2 this is. However, you might know it for your car, because this is typically, or at least for some people, a buying decision. You might know it for your fridge, at least you might know the energy rating of your fridge. But you don't, don't do this for software. Coming back to this later. So, what is the concept of the tool? Um, so, before I dive into screenshots, I have to talk a bit dry stuff, and then we see actually some, some stuff which some of you can probably better relate to. Um, by catering for these boundary conditions that I told before, what we do, and I will just go quickly over it, and we can talk about it later, so, so we think we have quite an ample time for Q&A, is we package a software in containers, so we leverage some functionality that Linux has on board, um, to isolate the applications as good as we can and to get the most reproducible metrics as good as we can. For people who are not developers, I try to put it here in a graphic that makes you understand of what a web application is comprised of. So if you use something like um, EcoGrader or you use something like Website Carbon, many couple of people maybe know it as a service where you plug in your website, just the URL, it's a form box, and it tells you, okay, by going to this website, you would, um, you have produced, or there was a um, budget occurred of 0.5 grams of carbon, right? Because all the electricity, the network transfer, etc., adds up to a certain carbon budget. What this only tells you, these uh, tools, is only this right part. So it only tells you what the browser is sending to you in terms of network. However, as probably everybody of you knows, there is also a server that actually delivers this website. So here we're talking about the left part. So when we talk about benchmarking or measuring an application with our tool, we always want to look at the whole distribution that is possible. So here we're talking about a very easy distribution. It's just the front end part, so the right part, the Chrome browser, and it's a server part. So here we're talking about the database, which stores the data, whatever you're looking at. Let's say you go to Facebook, so that the posts and everything is in there. And a server that's basically delivering the data in a format that the browser can understand. And our tool orchestrates all these three containers, isolates them from each other, queries these metrics separately that you need to understand what is actually going on there and also to need to get the energy. And it puts them in Docker containers. This is, a, I would say, technicality here in particular. But the isolation is the important part. And also the firing it up and firing it down because then you can also see when the application starts. So boot time is obviously a phase and when it cycles down. Going one slide further, I'm going to keep it short because I know people hate UML diagrams in general, but what you can see on the left side is that there is something ingested. So you have architecture files that you typically use, Docker files, you have Kubernetes files, which I have to say Kubernetes is not yet supported, but coming to that later on, but you will have at some point Kubernetes. You can consume a Docker Compose file, or it can also ter technically consume a Terraform file, or whatever you feed in, whatever you already have, and then you give it a flow that you typically also already have. So people typically have unit tests of some sort. They have end-to-end -end tests, either in Selenium, Codeception, whatever. Um, session replays, you can think of it, whatever you already have for your application, typically to keep the quality of the application in check. But you can feed that indirectly because it, typically you test what you believe is important and what people typically use in your application. So this is what you also have to look where the most energy, uh, where, where the least energy should be drawn. Then it's put into the green metrics tool. So this is our logo, extremely creative. You probably have seen these brackets before. And it orchestrates these containers, containers are measured, and then this is basically the metrics that you, that you want to collect, and it puts it out into APIs. So I think the most important point that you see here is that stuff is ingested, so we try to reuse stuff that developers already have, so not create another very complex tool, and everything we output comes out as a POSIX stream. So you can feed it to a file, you can feed it to a Grafana dashboard, you can feed it to an API, wherever you want it to. So every one of these reporters is separately reusable. If everybody thinks, and you're also happy to contribute, I'm coming on this later, if you think, hey, I can do this better, I want to reuse something from it, you can reuse the components, they're all open source, every free to, free to use. So how does the output actually look like? And what is 
presented to maybe non-extremely technical users, but more like people in, in a management domain, so to say. Um, coming to normal users also later on. So here is what the output looks like if you just look at the compound metrics. So typically, this is metrics you typically get from profiling applications, right? You get your network I.O., you get the memory average, and you get the CPU load. And these are metrics that are also, I would say, easy to get, technically. Me measuring is, uh, uh, the values are typically known. Every one of you knows kilowatt hours. This is just milliwatt hours, so it's divided by a thousand and then another thousand, then you you obviously can guess software incurs very lower values compared to like a vacuum, which directly hits with one kilowatt hour, uh, sorry, with one kilowatt if you let it run for an hour. And here you see that this is the energy budget of the CPU, this is the energy budget of the memory of the DRAM, this is the memory budget of the network for people who have never seen how the network has an energy budget. This is typically done when you say there's transfer happening and because it has to go through, through routers, it has to maybe go over a satellite, it has to go to, um, uh, through basically network components of any kind, they are plugged into electricity, uh, into the electricity grid, so they obviously have a network, uh, have an energy budget uh, entailed to them. This one you cannot measure directly, you have to use a formula. And the way you typically go is you take the kilowatt hour, uh, sorry, the kilobytes or the gigabytes transferred, you multiply it with a constant or with a dynamic factor. You can get them out of papers, you can get them out of databases. And then you have an idea of what on average a network request would consume that has gone th uh, back and forth. We make compound metrics out of it. I think this is um, pretty clear. You can add up CPU and memory, and then you get to here, right? So I think this is very easily understandable. But also we measure at different points. So, so these measurements here, we get directly from the CPU. There is in modern Intel CPUs and in AMD CPUs, and nowadays also in many ARM CPUs. Um, there is a kind of like a voltage regulator on the CPU, which can tell you how much the CPU is currently consuming. These values we measure outside of the system, so this is the AC power, this is what you directly get from the wall plug, so this is what you maybe have seen in your house when you want to say, hey, how much is my microwave using, and you just plug this thing from Amazon on, which is 20 euros or so, so we have this kind of like cable through the PC but in our lab, but it gives the same reading, and ATX energy is basically if you look at the main board after the PSU, it's, it's a technicality, just wanted to tell you if you look at the numbers here. And you get the CO2 out of it, which basically comes out of the electrical energy. So you lose electrical energy as a proxy. You look at your grid where you currently are. So let's say I am here in Berlin, so we have a mixed grid. So I would use a higher factor to get from kilowatt hours to energy. If I'm in France, I have a nuclear energy, I use a lower factor. And this factor you get out of an API. Um, here you see also another part of the tool which basically tells you some overview metrics. Um, so I think the most important takeaway part is here is the duration and that we pin repositories. So we picture that every software that is open source or in some form of repository should be measured and it should be directly visible to other people okay. At this point in time, sorry, at, at this point in time I will be looking at this repository and then I know what exact version of the software was measured. What we could make here on top is also the hash of the current GitHub commit, which would make it easier for developers, but, but you already have all the information that you need just looking at this to say, okay, this is what was measured, and here we have measured um, a reproduction measurement of the Blue Angel for Ocular. Blue Angel is a software certificate. I don't know if a talk by Jens Gröger, for, for instance, today has already happened, so he has been talking about that. And we've just reproduced the measurement with our tool to show that it's capable of um, uh, doing the certification process. So yeah, the certificate pinning is the, is the important part that you can look, okay, this is the software version that was measured and I can falsify myself so you don't have to trust our tool and the readings that it uh, puts online on the free data um, open API database. This is a typical graph you get out of it. So as I said in the top left, charts obviously, I think the chart itself doesn't tell you much, but it tells you that here is a CPU utilization measured on container level, a CPU utilization on a system level, and there is also another chart which then gives you the energy, and what I've done here in particular, and I will cycle back and forth a bit, is that you can see that 
energy and utilization is very similar, but it does not necessarily align always. So it can be, depending on what instruction the processor issues, or if there's currently a hold on the processor, like if it's currently fetching memory and cannot really do instructions, you will get some deviation in these charts, which, depending on which granularity you want to measure on, can be important for what you're doing. Um, you see here some other metrics, which basically takeaway message here is, and I said this before, you have these plugins in our tool, and you can also write a plugin yourself. It's usually just 100 to 200 lines of code to get these metrics from somewhere, and you can hook it into the tool, and it will generate a graph out of it for you, which basically displays the usage over time for this specific resource. So here's CPU utilization, memory total, memory energy for... Uh, REPL MSR, this is this thing on the th CPU, the voltage regulator that I've been talking about, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what kind of applications are supported with the tool in particular? So the application that the tool currently supports is a desktop application like Firefox. It is put in this container that I've told before. Uh, but from there on, you can use it normally. So you can feed it any URL it has to go to. You can uh, also give it a plug-in, et cetera, and then get an energy budget out of it. It can take in command line applications. This is particularly interesting because this also means that machine learning models are directly included. So if you've ever worked with Python, it typically is just a call on the command line. So this is what our tool can directly use um, and directly generate all this data from you if you just you just have to give it one line where it shall call the application. It will fire up all the containers for you. And you can obviously use web applications because this is where I came from and where the idea for the tool was originally born. So here you have to do a bit more for the infrastructure file because you have to tell which server to use, which image, and how they are connected. But as said before, you might have these files already because it can consume a standard Docker file. Um, Docker Compose file, sorry. Um, what can you do with it in terms of analysis? So I've, I've told you now, okay, these charts are coming out of it, but what are we, for instance, looking in particular when we generate an application report, right? It's, it's not just for a certification process. I want to do something actionable with it as a developer. So different code, different scopes. So for a machine learning application that typically runs I don't know how big models a couple of you build, but the machine learning apps can run for a couple of days. So typically, you utilize all the resources anyway as much as you can. So your CPU runs at 100% all the time. You can just come in. It's no problem. You can also walk here behind me if this is, any, if this is a fit. Um, yeah, so for machine learning apps or for running code, you typically want to just get the energy budget. You just want to know, okay, how much does it even... Um, cost to run one training on my machine learning model, or how much does inference on my model cost? Because oftentimes, people don't really know. They know what they are built by the cloud providers, but they don't know the energy budget that is entailed with it. And we believe that it becomes more important over time, and we want to create also a tool that can bring this transparency in the world, so just people know and society can make a decision on it. Uh, whatever that means. I mean, it can be that it's okay for a machine learning model to consume 1,000 terawatt hours if it has the right use case, right? For web applications, it's typically Im important to identify idling systems. So this is where, if you're a web developer, a concept like serverless typically comes into place. So people should use serverless in order to get this idle time down. But our application can tell you how bad it is really that your machines are constantly idling and you're not cycling your machines down and where in the application workflow these idle times actually occur. Uh, for algorithms, it's important to understand how your code behaves if your system is differently configured. So here it comes into play what I told before, that if you want to measure on a very high granularity, then it is important to really not only look at CPU utilization, create an idea of the energy from it, but look at how your application behaves when it's configured differently. For instance, our tool, Shell, it currently consumes just part of it, but it Shell consumes all the typical parameters you have to set to make your measurement reproducible. So a CPU typically cycles up and cycles down the frequency all the time. It can go into turbo boost, so it can even use a bit of more energy for a certain period of time to make, like, for instance, uh, making the monitor, like flipping it up and your PC responds directly. This typically has a bit of an energy cost because the CPU can go into a turbo state very quickly to be very responsive. But there's also more to the equation, what, what a CPU in terms of features has uh, that come along with it. 
So here you see a typical memory anomaly that you would typically not get out of a formula. So the typical formula that's currently used in the cloud is the more memory you use, and here you see that the memory budget goes up, um, the more memory you use, the more energy you will consume. So you mul typically multiply it with a constant factor. This is how it's done in tools like Cloud Carbon Footprint or in the TEATS engineering model. If you've heard that, it's some models that people use to measure cloud energy at the moment because we don't have many sensors available in the cloud. But you would expect the same qualitative shape on the right side because you see here, this is memory energy and this is just memory total. So here you see a very different curve. So this is what, what I, also these curves can, can align. This is, uh, this is not atypical that they align, but this is kind of a memory anomaly, you would say, because you use more memory, but actually the energy of the memory is not really consumed. Because, so, so you, you now have to drill down what the, what the case here is in particular, but it's mostly because memory is reserved, but there is no writes or reads happening in this one particular. Then you have here a system that kind of has a creep over time. So you see here that although I'm running a constant load in terms of CPU, um, which is not given here, but um, you, you have to take my word that there is a constant CPU load behind it, is that the memory typically goes up over time, uh, sorry, the energy goes up over time, which is a normal feature of a CPU, so the CPU gets hot. There's a quadratic function for the transistors for a hot system to use more voltage and in turn uh, more amps. But then it also goes down a bit, and this is because some instructions are already cached. So, so you're still using high CPU utilization to query all the information, but you, you, you typically don't have, to, um, don't have to do costly compute anymore. This is our current understanding of this code in particular. What I don't want to give you here is an explanation why stuff is happening, but I, will I want to give you a, a view of how our tool can use to spot something here and say, okay, what is actually going on here? And is this even relevant even, right? Because we are also talking maybe not about strong jumps here in, in the data that you're seeing, but you wouldn't have seen this before if you don't measure the energy over time, what your code is actually doing because the CPU utilization was constant. So you see here that, that there is a difference in this one in particular. Um, going to the example that I had before with the service in particular, as you can figure, web servers are mostly idle, right? They are provisioned to have a, um, to handle a peak load, but not always people are going to the website and using it constantly. However, there can be another case, which is qu quite confusing, actually, what we have here measured, is that you see here, this is how our green metrics tool displays it, every color is a part of the front end, back end tuple that I've told you before. So blue is actually the web server, which serves the HTML data. Green is the puppeteer container, so this is the browser, this is Chrome. And yellow is the database, and red is the nodes. So this is the stuff that you see here. So you would expect that if you make a request, right, so the browser has a peak, so we are looking at CPU utilization here, so the browser has a peak in terms of utilization, so something is happening on the browser. And then the server responds, and it fetches something from the database and then displays it to the browser, and the browser renders the page. So this is basically what happens here. And then here is the next page coming, and here you would expect that here, after the request has happened, the system should go to idle, right? The browser is actually going to idle. The browser is not doing much. So a bit of here, but it's so minimal. Um, but why is the web server constantly drawing CPU utilization? So what is it doing? I, I actually don't know. Maybe there's also a good reason for it. Um, I, having a web, being a web developer for 16 years now, I don't know the good reason. So uh, it's, it's, but it's still interesting. I mean, uh, Apache is usually a solid web server, so I would be curious of what's going on here. But this is where I would be looking at um, if I were the developer. And what we also want to do with the tool is that we want to have users and developers challenging the developers and asking, what is your tool actually doing here? I mean, you have a good reason, fine, but why do you use energy all the time if there's really nothing happening? Is, is, this, is this for the good or is this for the worse? Could be prefetching resources, right? Could be doing something very logical, but it could also be like bad code. So this is what you can, for instance, do with our tool, and this is what you then can do as a user later on when you want to spot um, problems in the application or why your battery is currently draining if you uh, look into mobile. What is our vision for the tool? So basically the roadmap that we want to 
have features coming in over the next couple of months um, or even longer. So first of all, technical features. So we currently don't have Android application and Windows support. Quite interesting, but since Android applications are already very optimized, this was not the first thing that we've been looking at. Uh, distributed application, which basically power most of what we have on the infrastructure cloud side at the moment. So typically, um, yeah, no relevant application is ro only run on one single node, right? Because we have to look at distributed applications in particular. We can do this currently in Docker setups. So if you use Docker Swarm, for instance, or typically easy Docker container service, this one works. But Kubernetes, for instance, doesn't work. And, and other very strong distributed systems don't work. So this is what we want to look at. Inline reporting is very important. So I would really make a decision as a developer on a, uh, on a software just looking at the GitHub repository and seeing a batch, okay, this software uses, uh, for just its testing process, let's say one, one ton of CO2 a day, because it runs a thousand times a day, it's a very large code base, and it runs two or three pipelines in parallel, for instance. I would make a decision for it if I were to know that, right? So we want to make our tool to be pluggable in something like GitHub Actions. So where these CI CD pipelines typically run, or as a GitLab reporter, where you can get an awareness of the testing costs. Uh, we want to have energy splitting on the process level. I talked about this technicality before. So currently we split the, um, the energy by time. On a, um, for the energy we get from the CPU, so you get the total energy of your system and you have to split it by time to account for only the process, but also splitting on an instruction level is very interesting if you want to have the tool used in more granular environments. So this is a very strong technicality, but I thought interesting for people who are a bit deeper in the, in the material. And we want to, at some point, like this is the finish line, so to say, we want to provide recommendations for energy optimizations automatically. So without you having a background uh, in this field and looking at the charts and knowing exactly what is going on to see, ah, okay, this is what I can do better the way that Google Lighthouse does it at the moment. It tells you, hey, you're requesting this resource five times, although I've already seen it on the first page. You don't have to do that. This is what we want to do uh, in our tool also. Providing developers with answers. So our tool is, is mostly tailored to developers at the moment, but we want to shift to users at some point. We'll talk about developers now first. So a typical developer question that comes up that we see in our meetups here in Berlin is that people ask, okay, I can do a static website, but how much do I actually save compared to WordPress? Or I know about Gra GraphQL, but is it so much better than REST just looking at the energy? I mean, we've heard about response times can be faster and you don't overfetch, but actually, I, I don't know. Like, can, can you tell me? Is Flask better than Fast API? Like, if, if you're using Flask or if you're using Fast API, they are mostly identical for my use cases. I've used them before. Both are frameworks where you can make an API with. Um, so how do I decide if all the boundary conditions are equal and I'm free to choose the most energy efficient framework? How would I know? I, the data is currently not out there and there is also not that many tools that can measure energy in general. And we believe that our tool can be an answer for developers to answer this question. And GraphQL, I had it before. This is, for instance, one question, and here you see it as the first question that we have tried to answer. So we have made a case study on our website where we have built an identical site once with a static site builder. So something that, if you, if you don't know what, for instance, WordPress does exactly, WordPress is blogging platform, fetches the data from the database every time you request, if, if it's not uh, particularly configured, but in the, in the default mode. It fetches the data every time you visit the page. It generates the dynamic page all the time anew, the template all the time anew. And if you use a static site, it just spurts out, just, just reading from the file system, just spurts out the file as HTML. And this is what is called Hugo. So this is the system we have been using. And here you see WordPress. So what you see here on the right side is that for one request on a page, WordPress consumes the amount of energy in, and I think the value is joules here that we're looking at, but even if it were kilowatt hours, the, the relative ratio counts. So let's say it's joules because this is also very, um, this makes sense that it's 10 joules. Um, you see here that you, you need to use 10 joules just to deliver one page with WordPress. However, if you have a static site, you are at around 1.5 joules. 
one fair point you have to say, in order to generate a static site, you have to build it at some point, right? It's just not there like WordPress all the time. So WordPress generates these sites fresh when a request comes in. So you have to pre-create all the possible pages. So this here can be um, can even bit, uh, go a bit up if you have like 10 variants of your web page that could be handled by this request in particular. But the important takeaway message here is that for our system in particular, where we had, I think, 30 sub pages, this is the whole build of all 30 sub pages. Sorry, I confused requests and build before. So, build is your left side, and this is the actual request. So, for all the 30 sub pages, this is all the cost that was needed to generate the whole page. And then, looking at one particularly page, one particular page is this bar chart here. And you can see the uncertainty range because we have made a couple of iterations. It can even be so close to zero that our tool could not even measure it, given the uncertainty. Could also be higher, to be fair. But what you see here is that you can easily generate 30 pages and make a full request when WordPress could not even handle a fourth or a fifth of a request in particular. So, so this is the energy difference that we're talking about. And WordPress is one of the, if not even the most used and most distributed web application that we currently have. Um, what is our vision for the tool for users? So providing users with answers. For you as a user, you typically want to say, um, if I have a software, given certain boundary conditions or a user scenario, how do, they, how do they compare? And I will jump a bit forward because now reading it, the question is a bit more too complex. I want to show it to you in the picture. So if you just look at Telegram and WhatsApp, what would be interesting to you is say, hey, I know Telegram uses less network I.O. and this is no actual data, this is a concept picture, so we have not measured anything here, but it could be a typical outcome. You say, hey, Telegram always advertises it's using less energy, and uh, it uses less network because it saves so much in terms of images, caches, whatever. But in turn, it uses more CPU in order to leverage these caches or to unpack data, et cetera, et cetera. And this is one possible visualization that could be consumed by a user because I have seen charts like this. I don't know if you have seen these charts when I compare mobile phones. So when I compare mobile phones on versus.com, I see, oh, okay, it has, a, it has a bigger battery, but in turn, it does not have Wi-Fi 5, and in here, it does not have Bluetooth 4. So it don't have to be these cryptic values here, which maybe are not in your daily life. Like, typically, not everybody looks at DC energy all the time. But it could also be different values. We're saying, for sending a message, it is at this point. For sending a video, it is at this point. And then you look here to WhatsApp, where sending a video is maybe out of the chart, but sending a message is maybe lower, right? And they say, hey, I'm just sending messages. I'm a WhatsApp user. Or I'm sending video, Telegram's better. It really depends on the boundary condition if you can make these switches, but currently you don't even have the data to make the decision. So this is what we picture for as a user to consume our data. So it will not be non-technical. It, it will not be a no-brainer which just, just use WhatsApp. This is not coming out of it. I, at least I don't believe that this is possible. But if you want to make even an informed decision, our tool will hopefully de give this information at some point if people use it as an open source tool and generate and measure these data. Um, network level anomalies, so this is also a bit cryptic now because I want to make it approachable to user, I'm probably going to reformulate it in the next iteration of the talk. But what you are probably interesting or what's probably interesting for you as a user is just to see how often is my Facebook application or whatever application querying a service, like how often is it making update requests? Is it making every five minutes? Is this really necessary? Or is it even going to an ad service instead of just to graph.facebook to fetch the latest messages? Is it even going to, um, mm, is it, yeah, is it fetch, fetching ads? This is basically what, what I want to say, for instance, because this is typically what you don't want to have of your application. You want the functionality, but you don't want the app, you don't want the tracking, you don't want the telemetry. And you can see in our tool, um, if this is really happening constantly or just one time a day or even at all. So this is what I mean by transparency and also giving users choices. And it can also issue a certificate. So the Blue Angel for Software is a possible certificate which, can, uh, which could be issued because this one applies some minimum standards that, we, that the Blue Angel wants to have for application. Like it has to, um, yeah, it, it has to have a minimum amount of uh, energy that it should be using at least in the, in the next iteration. I've had this chart before. So this is hopefully a slide that is better consumable for users. So if you 
If you want to take away something away from the slide, what we believe could be the vision of the tool is that you can think of it as the UCA or the code check of software. So typically when I um, look at something um, that I buy from DM or that I buy from Rossmann, I want to know if there's something in there that I don't want in particular. I'm not allergic or so, but I don't want microplastics, for instance, in, in my shower gel. So this is what you can do with Kocek. Kocek directly tells you, yeah, if you want to drill down, this is all the special Inca names that is in here, but it also tells you with a red flag at the top contains microplastics. So, so the typical warning signs that people really want to look for, this we picture for our tools. So a typical warning flag that could be is this software is, or this data center of this software are in Poland, and Poland runs on coal power. So this might be a decision where you say, no, this is not acceptable for me, it's, it's okay if you use energy in general, but please host it at least somewhere where you have hydrothermal energy, where you have solar power. So, so this is easily digestible. It gives you a, directly, a, a binary decision, basically. So you say, okay, I don't support coal. You can also say, I don't support nuclear energy if this, if this has a different concern for you, although it's in this context of CO2, a, a positive energy form. But this is what we want to have. We want to have it at some point as easy as Yuka and Kocek to make decisions for user just asking, is there a more carbon-friendly alternative to my software, or is there a software that makes less network requests, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So this is the end of the talk, and as I said before, the software is open source and super happy to get contributions or interest for you from you of any kind. Um, we do have a meetup group here in Berlin where we host free meetups for everybody who's technical or non-technical. We have had speakers like Chris from the Green Software Foundation before, the KDE team, which basically makes the KDE Plasma desktop, and they have been talking about their free and open source software approach with the Blauer Engel. Um, and also some other green companies here from Berlin, and also talks from us, like our projects, how they are going along. Um, yeah, we're looking for contributors in the tool, but also super happy, hit me up directly if you're just interested in the concept and want to have me explain more. Or if you just want to talk to me on, uh, on green coding in general or something else, just also write me on LinkedIn or also write me an email, whatever works for you in terms of a tool. So thank you very much, and I hope we have time for questions. Um, yeah, do you want to hand mics out? Sure, there let's do that. one microphone, which is here, so you have to pass it. Um, I, I would like to ask a little technical question. How does it work? Is it somewhat like a site, uh, like a site container? Or uh, does working in, inside of the container I'm currently working, or on the host system? And the second question there, uh, what is missing on Kubernetes or what is the difference that this doesn't work on Kubernetes or Yeah, so um, it works outside of the Docker container system. So basically the Docker containers run all rootless and we are on the host system and we orchestrate these containers. So we can control the Docker daemon and orchestrate these containers and then we pull the metrics you can pull them with Docker stats. Technically, we use a different approach. We pull them out of the Linux subsystems, so out of the virtual file endpoints, and then we can generate the metrics. So we are not forwarding the endpoint inside of the Docker container to measure in there. Um, but it could be done. Scaphandra, for instance, does it like so. If you Google up later on, Scaphandra is another tool that can measure energy. It does it like so. It, however, cannot do this orchestration part. It just can forward this information in the container for you if you control the hypervisor. So if you run QEMU somewhere, for instance, Hetzner, for instance, does it, you could forward it to the client into the hypervisor. So this is what our tool cannot do, but Scaphandra, for instance, can. Uh, coming to your second question, can you go again, please, on the second question? Uh Based on these technical things, what is missing on, on, on Kubernetes? So well, what's the difference there? Because we have almost the same situation. Yeah, exactly. So, so the files are very similar. So just supporting Kubernetes would be probably a very minor point. The thing is that Kubernetes typically, um, if, if you control the architecture yourself, the change would be very minimal, right? But this would mean that you have to set up your own Kubernetes cluster, which people typically don't do. So it would be nice if you can use a Kubernetes server. 
uh, service, right? So you go to Google, use their community service, and then just use our tool inside of it, so to say, if, if you want to call it like so. The problem, and this is basically true for all the cloud services at the moment, is that all these machines have locked down certain points where we query data from. So you cannot read REPL, for instance. This is the thing that Intel provides, the running, running average power limit, because this is a register in the CPU that is only available in ring zero, so you have to have a kernel extension installed in Linux to get this information, and this one is typically locked down. So what we are doing at the moment, before we go this one step further, is we're trying to create a machine learning model that can kind of estimate the information of energy based on the utilization metrics, right? This is what I said before, that CPU utilization and energy does not always co-align. We have to get that first down to make solid predictions of what we are expecting the energy really to be, and then we could plug it into the Kubernetes service, even running inside of the pod. So it, it does not, uh, sorry, even running inside of the container. So it does not have to be on the pod orchestrator level. It can then be used inside of the container. So this is the problem in general. But if you have Kubernetes self-hosted, you could use the tool. Thank you very much. All right. I'm not super experienced with the uh, REPL counters, but I thought they uh, only allow for like system-wide uh, measurements. Yes. And then my question would be, um, how can you attribute the energy measurements to some such a certain application? Yeah. So um, th th this is what I had before in splitting by time and splitting by energy. So an easy way, and uh, our tool does this currently in, in the dev branch, it's not in the main branch, is that you just say, you look at one minute of time, you have two kilowatt hours, so it's a very strong example here, but bear with me, so I have two kilowatt hours, and I have two applications running, right? And then I look at the information of CPU utilization, and I see, okay, this application has run for, let, let's say it was one kilowatt hour. This application has run for 10% of the time, and the other application has run for 90% of the time, right? And then you would say, okay, this one is then 100 watt hours for this application, and this is 900 watt hours for the other application or for just being, uh, being idle, right? So this is how you split by time. This, however, has the problem that time does not always um, co-align with the work that has actually been done. So you would assume that the instruction that the processor was issuing has a different energy budget entailed, right? There are, there are vector instructions which use very many registers. There is a pause instruction. There is a no-op instruction. Um, so you would say, okay, it would be nicer to look at the instructions than just at the time because this gives me a more better idea which work has actually been done, right? Because the instruction is kind of the unit of work. Um, yeah, so, so there's two ways to split it. Um, to be fair, I have seen no implementation of instruction splitting so far. This is what we're currently working on. But you probably need both. The way we currently, or we also need PSU energy, which is the energy that comes into the, uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, if you don't know what a PSU is, I mean, it's this net style in German, so it's basically the thing which converts the uh, AC power to the DC power that the mainboard kind of understands, and this one has losses, and these no losses can be nonlinear. So they are typically not that strong if your system is running at full power, but they make up most of the losses if your system is idling. So you need this measurement point, you need the measurement point on the mainboard, and you need the measurement point in the CPU directly. So this is why we see these two topics as very similar to generate all of these metrics at some point, but to answer your question in one sentence, you can split by, inst by instructions or you can split by time, to my knowledge, there but there might be more. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, thank you uh, for the talk and two quick questions. Um, one is, do you or did you measure um, stream processing engines yet, uh, or, or do you have a use case for that in your system? And the second one is, do you plan on including GPU or TPU measurements? Um, well, we can include GPU measurements. This is, I've, I've seen this very often. You can do this with the NVIDIA API. TPU measurements, I, you, you meant TPU, right? I'm, I don't have any experience in that. I don't know if there is, um, to mine, this is all ASICs, right? So, so you need some custom proprietary framework, if this even exists. I don't know if that exists, but very interesting. So if you work in that and you see it, please shoot me an email. And uh, we have not measured stream processing engines, but I would encourage you to maybe use our tool to do so and publicize the data. So it would be very interesting. And what I've not talked about before, so you can see this as, uh, as the second point. So if you just want to go after the talk and see something and also see the upload form we basically hosted, we host um, 
an implementation of our tool on metrics.greencoding.org. So you can use it locally as an open source tool. It will generate an own web server. But if you want to see where we publicize all the measurements that we have done, it is on metrics.greencoding.org. It looks a bit beta-ish, though, but you will feel at home if you've seen the slides before. <laughs> all right. Any else? Um, hello. <laughs> Uh, well, congratulations on the work. Actually, I think it's really awesome. Uh, I was going. I was curious about um, asking how will this affect if you are using many micro cloud services, for example, such as for many like file uh, management. It's completely different if you're just sending requests or if you're actually handling files, such as using Cloudinary or Firebase, some stuff like that. Uh, how will this be affected if you're using many cloud systems and if you are actually able to? I think you kind of mentioned it, that you are not having completely access to the CPU because the cloud service naturally doesn't give you. But how will this be affected, or how can we have like a better outcome about using this uh, green coding? So if, if you say, how is this affected, would, are you asking me how much the impact of all these services is that is put on top, or if they will react to our measurements? If it will be different, for example, if I am hosting all the services, or if I am using cloud services. Okay. Yeah, this is a bit hard to tell. Um, and I had, a, I had this, yeah. um, this, this is a bit hard to tell. And I had a discussion with Aideen here in the audience before. So if you want to hit him up about cloud functions and how actually this goes on, it's, it's a layer deeper, so to say. It's, it's not the full service, but it's already an implementation of that. So there is no data out of there. And since most of these services are kind of proprietary, we cannot tell. So a, a next interesting step that we want to do is that we want to host at least the function as a service platforms, right? We, we sit a layer deeper. So you orchestrate or, or you set up your own server made out of Amazon Firecracker, or you set up your own server made of the V8 worker engine from Cloudflare, and just see how the same application with the same workload, the same usage scenario, compares to a monolithic instance of Apache with JavaScript engine or service installed, right? So these two comparisons are super interesting because I'm a big fan of serverless, actually, but I don't know how much it actually has a gain. And we've asked um, Google, we have asked Cloudflare, and um, they are currently not share, they are not able to share. So I, I think the services are good, but they don't want to publicize or they don't even have the data. So, so this is what I can tell you from my personal experience. Yeah. And just curious, uh, you mentioned that there is a note that it's saying, what is the server and the database being activated over yeah. here? Yeah. Do you have uh, an answer, maybe? Might that be like web sockets or something related? Uh, in this scenario, not. It, it was just a really plain WordPress site. WordPress has no web so uh, sockets, to my knowledge. Um, but even if it is web sockets, right, why is the data transfer going on all the time? Um, it was not a chat application, and there was nobody on the other end. So, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so I would kind of love uh, the idea to, to have this in a CI pipeline running and yep. checking how much energy consumption my code actually has. Um, I mean, what would I need to do to have this? Would I need to have a bare metal machine that actually runs? I mean, I would need a bare metal machine to have access to CPU voltage APIs, right? Yeah. So I would have to set up a dedicated machine that runs your software and... Yeah, well, there's a couple of ways to do it. So last week, and I think Max has already left, Max from the SDAA, they hosted a hackathon last week with the uh, Umweltbundesamt, where this topic was strong ongoing. And what they provide, for instance, and I hope they will provide it to everybody in a bigger fashion at some point, is that they have a dedicated GitLab runner. So on GitHub, you just take an Azure virtual machine and it runs it for you, uh, which is quite nice. I really love the service, but this one has this lockdown problem. So it uses the Microsoft Hyper-V hypervisor. None of these re registers is available. So what you can do there is you can use a machine learning model with the estimation that we're currently working on. So you have to wait a couple of weeks, hope, and then use the model. So this will give you a good reading already. Um, however, if you want to host it yourself, you can um, 
plug this in GitLab, for instance. So in GitLab, you can plug in a so-called so GitLab runner, and this would be configured the way that it gives you this information. And there's currently a project from the SDAA where they try to open source this concept of a GitLab runner. So it's basically a, a Docker orchestrator that forwards Scaphandra, and we had the uh, you had, we had the question before, forwards Scaphandra inside of this container, and then you can read REPL inside of there. So it's a privileged container that has this measurement available, and then you just have to use one of our reporters, and then you have it. So it's three hoops, so it's not as easy as we want it to be at some point, but this is the current point in time where you could do that. So, yeah, so either use the SDA tool, host it yourself, plug it into GitHub, or wait for the model that we're currently working on. Does, does that answer your question? Otherwise, please shoot, yeah. please shoot a follow-up. But if you forward it into a container, then you have the double problem that you also have to calculate the share of the container compared to other runners doing the same thing on the same machine, right? The Doesn't share of a container, con <laughs> well, uh, I, I, th I think the GitLab runner is, al although it creates a container, it's, it's an isolated VM, so, so this, this is on its own. Uh, in general, you have this problem. So if you think about Heroku, right, you, and you create a machine learning model, you have a different operating point that you're on. So if you estimate of CPU utilization, you can tell what your CPU utilization is, but not the one of the whole package, which might have 10 cores. So this is a problem on its own. We're trying to fix that, but I can't tell you how good the model is at the moment because we're just gathering data at this point in time. Yeah, but good question, yeah. This is um, an ongoing problem. Yeah. Actually, when I'm in a, in a build process, uh, I can build big images or bi big Docker builds or small ones, which are very heavy for, for the network interaction. This is also a thing uh, we should, could measure it, right? Yeah, you could measure that. And there is actually a very good PhD thesis uh, from Zandro Creighton, if you ever look that up at some point. He has measured Docker build process in particular, and there are very interesting findings in there. Not only what you're talking about, that the Docker cache, where right? you, don you download resources all the time, like pip inside of the Docker container does not know which packages have been fetched, so it always refetches it, right? This is, this is what you mean. If, if you build something with Docker inside of the... Three years ago, I tried it a little bit, but very naive way, just uh, counting my CPU usage and yeah. trying different build strategies, a stacked one or a simple yeah. one and so on. And yeah. There's okay. a real uh, thesis. If, you, if you're five years ago, the thesis has actually, uh, Docker uses, uh, don't, don't pin me on, I think Docker uses build pack now. It's, it's, it's a new way of creating these images and it's way more energy efficient than five years ago. And this is actually what he talks about in the thesis. So look that up in particular. But what he also has found that if you work with Docker, you have typically Docker run, right? Where you can just fire up a container from the command line or you can use Docker compose. And just these two tools already have a five times energy budget, so, so five times in difference of the energy budget that they use just to start this container, not even talking about the build process. So there's a lot going in there. You could even use Potman versus Docker and look at this one in particular, right, because they have different approaches how they build containers. So yeah, this is an ongoing topic and um, we are trying to create the data to make this more transparent so you don't have to make this tedious runs all the time, but you get an overview picture of how do they generally compare. Yeah. Can you repeat the name of the author? Sandro Kreten, K-R-E-T-E-N. If you don't find it, just hit me up and I will ask him if I can send you the thesis that I have. But he has also a video on YouTube. So if you look on YouTube, Sandro Kreten, he presents most of the stuff in there in an easy, consumable 30 minutes format because the thesis, as you can figure, a thousand pages or so, how these doctor theses are. Yeah. All right. All right, Arno. Oh, cool. Time is up. Um, thanks for this very interesting talk and for the hard work you have done. Very exciting. So, big applause to Arno. Thank you.